Hey guys, and welcome to Quality Shop. And I've got with me Gil Gross, and we're going to be going over the Australian Open so far, and then previewing some of the third round matchups as well. Gil, how are you doing? I'm good. Always great to be on and uh, have my morning coffee with uh, talking tennis with you. Yeah, I know you've been watching a lot of the matches as well. Uh, so, how have you found it so far, the tournament? A little strange. Um, I the first match because there's so much going on in the early rounds. I'm generally not watching matches first ball to last every single point, and I'm trying to kind of collect different flavors of different matches. The first match I watched first to last was last night Medvedev Kyrgios, despite Raducanu going on at the same time. I ignored it, uh, and and that was a really great match. I enjoyed it a ton. But other than that, I find that there's been a lot of uh, a lot of upset bids that have been close that haven't panned out. Uh, if you look at like Karatsev against Munar, if you look at like uh, uh, Felix, really his last two matches, he's lost more points than he's won, and he's won both of those matches. It feels like there's a good portion of the top players who have struggled, but have still gone about their business and, and won the matches. The only real upset on the men's side has been Hercotch. And then yesterday morning on the women's side, you have, you have uh Contivate going out yeah. to, to Towson. Towson. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then Muguruza losing to Cornet. That was so. crazy. I, yeah. I, the Cornet one, I just did not see coming. I, I think for my, preview so i do like a really short segment of like seven eight minutes each day to like go over the results and then preview the matches for the next day and i said i, I remember saying like torsen's really exciting like she's a really exciting young player like people might not be as familiar with her but she's in the bracket of like the rider and fernandez is and like, yeah. that's how highly touted she is um a really young danish player and i thought that's a really tough match for Conte, but i didn't expect her to do it like that this is straight yeah. sets and just easy work it's crazy <laughs> She was she blew my mind in that match. I mean, how well did she play? I mean, I I just don't know. I don't know what what her better wing is, her forehand and her back or her backhand, because both are so deadly and fairly consistent. And the serve is the firepower is there on the serve, and now she looks like she's in better shape and she she moves better. So I'm I'm a huge fan. Rarely yeah. do you see. Uh, if I can add one more thing, rarely yeah. do you see the power combined with that control and steadiness that's what she has that's i think very special no i agree i agree she looks like a special talent for sure and yeah as you said like on the men's side there's been people struggling like struggling through so many matches like pcb had a five setter mm -hmm. like first andy murray obviously then he got knocked out against daniel straight sets and he had a five set against basilish philly which i can kind of understand because fine that's understandable. But then like PCB in the first round, I was like, what's going on? Like he was struggling so much. Uh, Corda struggled as well. Uh, I think he's had two five setters, if I'm not mistaken. I think back to back. Uh, if, I might be wrong. Um, but I mean, he's been like life or death, I think, really, in a couple of his matches. So absolutely crazy. Like uh, I think also, who else was it? It was a Karatsev, obviously, five sets against Manal, which you mentioned which was, I was watching the end of that, and that was crazy. That was a crazy match. That really was uh, unbelievable to watch. And I was just thinking, like, these guys, they're just making it really hard for themselves. Um, yeah. But I think it's also, I guess, lack of practice as well, um, beforehand, like, match practice anyway. Uh, so Kratzev, obviously, although he had played the week before. But I feel yeah. like we're seeing a lot of walkovers because of that as well, like people who have played a lot of matches in a very short period of time. So either they're... They haven't had enough, enough match practice or they're a bit burnt out because they've just played a whole tournament in one week and they're playing the Australian Open. Um, I, was, I was just thinking, I've seen a little bit of a pattern with that, with a few walkovers, uh, which is a bit of a shame. Like Bencic obviously um, retired and and that was a bit of a shock and some others as well. But do you think that's a factor actually? I, was, I may as well ask you in terms of burnout because it's the first tournament and do you think uh, players... What do you think? Is, is it better to play that tournament beforehand and potentially make a final like Bedosa did when she was injured in the first round, but she went got through and Murray, obviously, Karatsev? Or is it better, like Kokinakas, right? He got yeah. injured. He won in yep. Sydney. Or is it better to just skip that but have less match practice going into it? I, I like the week off. And I've, I've looked at... I haven't collected real solid data, 
but I've certainly collected a ton of anecdotal evidence that you should not play the week before a major. If you're going to do it, I would say this is probably the best tournament to do it at. I'll also add that like Djokovic played Belgrade. That was one, you know, and, and one Belgrade two. It was such a walk in the park for him. I don't think he lost a set. And I don't, I mean, you know, he, he faced Alex Mulcahn in the final uh, there, for example. It was just, it's it, it was just so easy for him but uh in general yeah it's it's better to rest it's better to be 100 percent and fresh you know monfils i wonder how injured he was when when he pulled out in adelaide because he won the week before and I, I wasn't watching i'll admit but i saw him i saw him withdraw due to injury and i was like is that a good thing for him because i wouldn't want him to play two weeks in a row to start the season and then play the Australian Open. And so far, it seems like he's very healthy and, and it is a good thing for him. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, and who was, I think it was, so I said about PCB in his second, uh, having a couple of five sets. I know he had a five sets against Greikspor, who went on a ridiculous uh, run. I think it was actually on your Twitter uh, that you said that he'd uh, had a really good run of matches. Obviously, I think he beat, was it Fognini in the first round? Yeah. Uh, which was a really impressive win, I thought. Um, I actually saw him live at Wimbledon. So he got absolutely blown away that it was by uh, Alexander Zverev in the first round of Wimbledon. And uh, probably not his, definitely not his best showing and best day. But um, I saw like a little bit and I was like, you know, not, not a bad player, but he just Zverev's really good. And <laughs> that's fair enough. <laughs> but he, he was he the only good. player at the US Open who <clears throat> lost in straights to Novak. Oh, wow. Everyone else took a set. Classic, yeah. <laughs> not the record you want to have. <laughs> not yeah. you want to have. He, he's probably thanking you for, for pointing that out. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> no, no, but but he's he's very impressive. But but I guess I guess one thing to note is when he's had his like stadium court major yeah. matches against the, the elites, he he hasn't been able to really challenge them. It's yeah. not it's not a concern or anything, but yeah, definitely something to notice. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Um, has it been weird to only have Rafa in the draw? Like, obviously, Rafa's here. No Novak, no no Roger. We won't go into the Novak situation. I think we've talked, everyone, everyone's talked that to death, really, to be fair. But is it a bit strange just having Rafa here? And, and what do you think in terms of, uh, I'm assuming you haven't watched, obviously, all his matches, as you said, but from what you've seen and, and how he's looking and how he's talking, I mean, uh, what do you think in terms of his chance? I know I asked on your channel and you said he's probably below Zverev and Medvedev. He's alongside yeah. the Sitsipasses in terms of uh, favorites. But how have you, how have you uh, I guess, well, how do you think he's been uh, matching up to the rest? Well, I don't think he's played a, a strong enough opponent where we can tell at mm. this point. I, I didn't watch that much of, of Giron, but I watched a lot of Hoffman. And yeah. Hoffman did a lot of things well against Rafa, a lot of things that are... You know, are challenging to Nadal. He's got a great backhand wing. So when when Nadal was hitting that cross court forehand, Hoffman was handling it very well and hitting very solid backhands. Yeah, he was. But they were all cross court, and you got to mix that up. And Nadal was kind of waiting on that ad side for a chance to pull the trigger down the line. Hoffman could hit great backhands, but directionally, it wasn't dynamic enough. Yeah. So and then you had the serve, where Hoffman hits kick serves pretty much. Uh, primarily, and you need an, you need other serves against Nadal, especially because that kick serve out wide on the ad side goes to Nadal's forehand, and Humphrey yeah. usually likes to kick that to the backhand. Uh, so, but he he looks good physically. The serve is pretty big. It's not. It, people are maybe overblowing just how big it is. I would. Uh, I need to see more. And I would need to compare it to 2019 and 2020 when mm. he was serving pretty big at the Australian <clears throat> Open yeah. and see what the numbers are. You can't compare it to 2021 because he was injured and he wasn't serving yeah. at full power. So I've yeah. seen a lot of a lot of the broadcast partners have compared it to 2021, and it's not really yeah. a fair comparison. No. So he looks he looks fine, but I still think that there's I still think the draw is tough. I think there's a lot of bad matchups ahead. It's interesting that he's not sliding. It's something that I, I have my eye on. I don't know oh, what, to, what to make of it, but he's protecting mm -hmm. the knee and protecting his foot. He's not sliding on the hard court. 
Mm. You got to see a player who's going to be able to ramp up the intensity, push them, make them move a lot more, and and challenge some of the things that a guy like like Hoffman isn't quite good enough to challenge. Yeah, agreed. He's got Hatchnov next, so that will be a challenge yeah. for sure. Um, I mean, how do you see that going? I, I'm, I'm a bit worried about that, honestly. So I'm obviously I'm doing a watch long for it tomorrow, so I'll definitely come out my commentary. But um, how how do you think you'll fare? Obviously, they've had a couple of fantastic matches in the past. Hatchnov mm-hmm. winning the silver medal last year didn't really kick on, to be fair, after winning that. But he's a solid opponent. Yeah, I think they're... I think this has the potential to be a close and highly competitive match. Hachinov, similar to Hoffman, he has the height and he's got a super solid backhand win. So again, Nadal with the cross-court forehand that he goes to so often to the righty backhand, Hachinov is one of the players who can really handle that well. And let's see if he goes down the line more than Hoffman because that was the missing piece for Hoffman, just not really being able to to make Nadal off balance because he's going the same way. Obviously for Hatchinov, you want to attack the forehand. You want to rush the forehand and we'll see what Nadal's efforts look like to do that. And the big change for, for Hatchinov last year is he, he was serving bigger and that's why I think the results got better. So let's see how Nadal returns. You know, Giron doesn't yeah. serve big. Hoffman doesn't serve big. He, his yeah. kick serves great, but not, a lot of miles per hour. Well, Hatchinov is going to serve a lot bigger. Let's see what the return looks like. Ultimately, the big thing with Hatchinov versus Nadal is you obviously have a huge difference in the in the baseline mobility. Usually, Nadal moves so much better, and that's the classic kind of matchup that that everyone in the big three is kind of feasted on, where they're they they just have a more dynamic game from the defense to the offense from the consistency when it comes to baseline rallies. And then, you know, the, the serve return is just neutralized because they're they're great returners. What do I think happens? I think Nadal, I think Nadal wins in four. Hmm. Yeah. Sorry, prediction. Uh, (laughs) prediction. Um, How do you think Zero has been? I think he's looked in spots, really good. I watched one of his matches in full against Milman. I thought he was a bit passive at times, got bullied around a little bit on the baseline. Uh, but then in the final set, he bageled Milman, and Milman didn't play badly. He just pl- started ramping up, and he served really well, uh, hit really well from the back of the court. There was a moment in the second set where he served a couple of double faults in a row, and it was like, oh, and he served six overall, and he just thought, oh, is it coming back? And he got through that and he was okay in the end. Um, overall, like a solid display, but in both matches, he said after, like he's not happy with how he's performed. But I think a positive sign for me is that after each match, he's actually gone, he stayed on the court and practiced. Very interesting. Um, so he was late for a media session. He got a bit of an interesting question from one of the guys in the media and he said, sorry, I'm late. I was practicing. <laughs> a bit <laughs> of, uh, yeah, a bit of defensive uh, mechanism there, but yeah, what do you think? I mean, look, obviously, is he in the bracket of Medvedev? Has he looked as impressive as Medvedev? Uh, is he right to be there? And and what do you think? It's obviously the earlier rounds. You don't want to yeah. peak in the earlier rounds, but you still want to be getting it done. He has been getting it done. But are there some causes for concern or no? I don't think so. You know, Zverev. I don't think he. I don't think he always plays well when he when he plays lower ranked players and not in the sense that he loses to them. I just, I don't know that he's great at, at maintaining his focus and his level uh, beyond a level that he needs. Like Medvedev is fantastic at it. Medvedev will take your soul and beat you six, one, six, one, six, one. And I find, you know, Zverev doesn't really do that as well. Now he's been last on, on labor. I think both, both uh, matches, right? So, so that's been kind of my sleep zone. So I, I haven't seen either of those matches really, but based on kind of the, the stats and the results, you know, I would, I would be hard pressed to be concerned at all about, yeah. about Zverev. And now he has Albert next. So, you know, Zverev is interesting because he's in by far the toughest quarter in the draw, but yeah. his section isn't great. And Lloyd Harris yeah. has been upset, but not that yeah, Lloyd Harris yeah. would have challenged him anyway, I don't think. But but yeah, his section isn't good. So he's not going to face uh, a top 20 player until the quarterfinals. 
Yes, which could be Nadal, if I'm not mistaken. It could be. It could be Nadal. It could be Karatsev. So the fourth round, he, although the fourth round could be. Well, no, he could play Shapovalov. Sorry, he, he yeah, can't yeah. face Shapovalov, who's yeah. who's really hanging on by a thread here. He, he's, he's, <laughs> well, he's, I get him and Felix have just been kind of getting through, but uh, life or death matches is hilarious. I just not, don't know what's going on. But I don't think oh. Shapovalov could, could challenge Zverev the way he's playing. It's not a good yeah. matchup for Shapovalov historically because Zverev's so good at absorbing the pace. But yes. uh, again, the, the return, it's like he, he made Sun Wukwan's serve look too good, in my opinion. Yeah. Right, yeah. and and that just concerns me because Sun Wukong has a good serve for his height, but yeah. it's not it's not on Zverev's level. Yeah. So I I wonder, okay, what's the return going to look like when yeah. he matches up against Zverev? It's a large take back, isn't it, that he has on the ground strokes, the large cuts he takes. I feel like he struggles to shorten it on the return and be comfortable returning like that. He always wants to take those large cuts, and it's like you if you're being rushed, you just got to shorten it. And I feel like he's just in that habit of doing it, which is. Which is understandable. It's hard to just suddenly snap out of it, but I'm sure yeah. uh, he will work on that. Um, I guess the other one that is Medvedev, who against Kyrgios, a really good match. You obviously watched that from start to finish. He had a, a pretty comfortable, well, very comfortable first round, and then second round against Kyrgios. Now, um, I mean, look, he was definitely pressed at times, but he served. I thought it was elite serving from him at mm -hmm. times. It was more. In the in the moments he needed it, it just came up good. And there was there was games literally where Kyrgios, after the match, after the game, would be like, "Oh, what am I supposed to do?" Like aces flying left, right, and center. He was trying to guess Medvedev's serve because he just didn't know where it was going, and he just thought, "I have to gamble here" because Medvedev was serving that well. Um, and after, I think he said something which I won't repeat exactly because it's a bit explicit. But I think he was asked, you know, what, what am I gonna, what are you gonna do? Uh, no, tonight, and he said, you know, basically, I'm gonna kind of have, uh, I'm basically, I'm gonna be haunted by Daniel Modo's serve, basically, uh, but in a more explicit way. Uh, so, <laughs> which is probably typical curious, but uh, he yeah. just said, look, you know, I played well, but Medvedev is arguably one of the best player in the world at the moment, and he just served like an absolute you know, demon, really. Um, and he struggled with it, but the one thing I wanted to say, actually, you would you would have watched it is. I thought the way that Kyrgios attacked the second serve at times is really impressive. And he's one of the only players that could do that. He was stepping in a foot within the baseline to to take on that second serve, hitting some really good returns, hitting some fantastic return winners even. And I was like, I've never ever seen anyone do this against Medvedev. And it was like, how? <laughs> it was just so impressive. Yeah. I was like, unbelievable stuff. Yeah, it was destroying the second serve yeah. of, of Medvedev's. I mean, we've seen Novak do it. Novak definitely did it in the in the final here last year with just brutally aggressive second uh second serve returns against Medvedev. It's not it's not the strongest second serve in the world, but he's improved it so much over the years. It used to be used to be super attackable, but Nick has that compact backhand and he's got such amazing dexterity on it. That yeah, he he takes it on the rise so early and so clean, and that was Medvedev's biggest problem. If you look at the game that that Kyrgios broke Medvedev's serve in the third set, the set that Kyrgios won, he hit mm. two massive massive backhand returns, exactly the one that you're referring to. I I do think Medvedev should have gone to the body, yes. um, and got to the he did forehand. Eventually, didn't he? I think he did eventually. Did he? That's yeah, good. Yeah. And yeah. um. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely what to do against that mm. because, as you said, Kyrgios was so tight uh, yeah. crowding the box. And that was also a part, the return strategy by Nick was also a part of why Medvedev hit so many aces because, I mean, Kyrgios probably should have backed up, but it's not really what he does. It's not what he likes to do, and it takes no. a lot of physical effort to get back into the point. And he uh, arguably, he doesn't really have the the luxury of, of doing that with his fitness, yep. but... As you said, lots of guessing and crowding the box. And it's the opposite of what Medvedev does, which is Sit stand back, as yeah. far back as possible and, and give myself time to react and try to chase down even those good serves. Yeah, 100%. There's actually a moment where it was a first serve. <laughs> he literally ran forward, Kyrgios. Almost, I don't know if he was trying to distract Medvedev or just to say, you know what, I'm going to concede the point almost. It was 40 love at the time. 
And the Serb just went straight past him and he was literally running forward and he then ran back to his tail. I was like, this is so weird. <laughs> I was like, oh, you only see this in the Kyrgios match. But to be fair to him, like, I thought he played really well, some phenomenal points. And that third set, which he won, was some really high-level tennis, I thought, from both players. Um, Medvedev, like, in, in terms of, you know, how he's been and after that match as well, is still the favourite, right? I mean, going yeah. for one of the favourites. Yeah, yeah, he's the favourite. He's the favorite. I mean, you know, you look at, first of all, I'm, I'm glad that they wound up on opposite sides of the draws, Zverev and Medvedev. Not that yeah. it's a given that they're going to meet in the final, but definitely that's that was the fair way for the draw to, to unfold. And then, you know, mentally, I think Medvedev having come off the win and not showing really any Dominic team-like signs of that win having an adverse effect on him. Um you just give him the edge mentally and and we'll see yeah. you know maybe Zverev can can pick up that big win and route to a Medvedev match and that could change some things but i still think head to head even psychologically Medvedev i mean he he just won 5 matches in a row and and Zverev won the last time yeah. but i think anyone who acts like that one win is going to erase uh, uh, you know, the last six matches of history against Medvedev and Zverev. I don't think it works like that. Yeah, agreed. 100% <laughs> agree. In terms <laughs> of from the men's, who else is, uh, from what you've seen or, or coming through, I mean, who have you been a little bit impressed by or surprised that they've gone out? Obviously, Korda beat Nori in the first round in straight sets, which was a really mm -hmm. impressive win, I thought. Nori not really himself. Right. Um, we've got like, you know, Berrettini's kind of got through and he's been okay. Um, Monfils, I mean, he's bageled uh Bublik and then breadsticked him as well just for good measure and he's he looks like he's playing quite well as well you know he's but who's caught your eye Monfils definitely I mean Tommy Tommy Paul um I was surprised he lost to Mirmir Kachmanovic who I think Kachmanovic is just gonna kind of be a better player this year than he was last Ooh. year which is uh which is interesting but then in that Djokovic quarter it is Monfils I mean He's he's destroying players, and that was kind of his issue throughout his career. It's just long matches, physical. Yep. It's it's Gail, it's round one, it's round two. What are you doing here? Yep. And, and he would gas out. Um, so it's great to see him beating players efficiently. And I think he has a chance to destroy Christian Garin. You know, I mean, I agree. I, think, I, don't, I don't think, think to win. Yeah, right. Uh, and but I that match might be another that is quick and and easy for Monfils. I think it has that potential at least. Monfils has the ability to do that to Gar to uh to Garin. So Monfils has caught my eye and then I guess I guess Alcaraz and and Sinner, you know, the uh, players who I picked to go to the semifinal and they have not been in any trouble and they have Oh been... really? So you, you picked them to make semifinals in this tournament? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so you think so Alcaraz Berrettini are backing Alcaraz then, I'm assuming? I, I am. I am. And, and, you know, it seems unrealistic that no, both no. of them. Well, I think in isolation, right? Center to the semifinal or Alcaraz to the semifinal. Yes, yeah. Those picks in itself is not that bold. To yeah. say they're both going to do it in the same tournament, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. See, it seems unlikely, but that's where I landed. Mm, okay interesting that's very interesting so so and who, who makes up the semi-finals then for you if it's Alcaraz and Sinner Medvedev and Zverev Medvedev and Zverev okay yeah fine fine no no dark oh, come on kill <laughs> <laughs> what do you think well, Alcaraz so go on well I, I actually had Nadal losing to Hercotch oh wow okay mm. and that was a matchup thing I mean I didn't think about Hercotch Losing. I, yeah. I obviously, I yeah, I, I ignored, I ignored Hercotch Manorino. That's a terrible matchup for Hercotch. <laughs> Poor Manorino. <laughs> well, yeah, but no, I mean, credit credit to him. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. look, he's actually similar to Andrea Seppi in play style, yes, who also yeah. beat Hercotch at the U.S. Open. So, Hubie just has an issue with these guys who mm. who take a lot of pace off the ball and like to to counterattack and yeah. anticipate. And he they they keep Hercotch off the net because of yeah. their court position because they hug the baseline. Hubie just can't come forward w where he yeah. finishes points. Yeah, agreed. I yeah. think it's interesting because Hercotch likes to counter attack too. Right, that's the problem. So yeah, he, exactly. He wants to. He wants that pace, and they're not really giving it to him. Um, but Alcaraz looks like he's got the 
the sleeveless on. I'm not going to call him Baby Nadal. He doesn't like it. But, you know, obviously there's been comparisons drawn and looks like he's bulked up a little bit. He looks... I mean, I was, I was watching some of his matches against Leovich and I was like, whoa, like he's looking really good. I was like, I don't want to get too excited, but he's looking really good just in his tennis. Um, what do you think? I mean, obviously you picked him to make the semis. Is he tracking towards that, do you think, from what you've seen of him so far? First two rounds of a major, it's definitely a good thing if I haven't watched you as much, right? So I think that's the case for both Sinner and Alcaraz because, okay, they're handling business where I'm like, checking in on your Pablo Carreño boosters of the world being like, are you going to lose? Uh, anyway, you know, I, I have him going to the semifinal and I feel great about it. What I've seen. Yes. He looks Alcaraz looks unbelievably fit. It looks like he's put on a ton of muscle. This is important. You know, this is necessary. These young guys often are just physically not ready and Alcaraz, it, it looks like he's getting very close to to ready to not only not only win these individual matches, but the season is long, and you got to protect your body. And this is this is a marathon, and you need to have it day in and day out. You need to need to be able to play long long matches and and be fine the in, in two days. Um, you have to be able to play long weeks and then be fine the next week, and. This is all about getting your body ready and that Alcaraz decided not to play in the lead up to the Australian Open because he wanted those extra days in the gym to build the muscle is is something that I love to see. I think that's classic investing in the future, great team around you, putting in the putting in the work and the sacrifice to to do the things that are maybe not as fun. It's more fun to go play. So I love that. And he's serving pretty well. And we all know that, that he just, he couldn't hit his spots last year. He, he wasn't a spot server at all. And that made his first serve very ineffective. And I, I think from what I've seen, that has gotten better as well. If you look at the ACE rates, they're much higher than they were last year. So he continues to do these things that just, they're grabbing my attention. And I, I really do think that he's, he's going to be in the top 10 by the end of this year and everyone should be jumping on the bandwagon. And then Sinner's <laughs> in a good section. Sinner's in a good section, and Sinner looks good as well. Liking that. Uh, the love affair that is Gil and Alcaraz continues. <laughs> yes, yes. The, the Murray in the top 10, I'm not sure about that now, but we'll see. He's got a lot, lot of the time left in 2022. So. I didn't pick that this year. Oh, didn't you? Oh, you went back. No, no, that was last year. Oh, that was last or, year. Okay. Or, or maybe it might have been the year before, actually. Or it might have been last year. I don't know. <laughs> I thought you did on my podcast. It's fine. It's fine. Oh, um, no, that's fair enough. Uh, what no, about... no, I don't see it this year. Sorry, go on. I, I don't. I don't see that this year. Yeah, yeah, I know. I think we'll see. We'll see. I think it's uh, maybe top top twenty. Maybe that'll be a good result. Yeah. Um, I was going to quickly ask you about two of the third round matches. We've gone through a few of them actually already, just in passing. But Palka Shapovalov, how do you see that shaping up? I see Opelka winning. Oh, um, again, just just observations about Shapovalov's pace absorption and and his his defense at this point. I mean, for Opelka, I haven't seen him, but for Opelka, you know, his he's extremely inconsistent mentally. Um, but whenever he kind of gets a couple wins under his belt, and perhaps he's he's fresh at the start of the year here. You know, he, he's been good when he's been engaged. It's just sometimes he's honestly not not focused and not putting in all of the effort. But uh, I do think I do think he has the potential to to ride his serve here. And also he's got a solid backhand side. So I do think as far as as far as handling Shapovalov's cross court forehand and his backhand down the line the way that Shapovalov actually really likes to build his offense Opelka does relatively and I know he's not a, he's not a speedster but yeah. relatively he he does defend the backhand side pretty well he defends it better yeah. than the forehand side so I like a couple of things in my gut based on how Shapovalov has played is is that Opelka gets through okay and quarter PCB that's tough it's tough. I'm gonna go with Corda. I'm gonna go with the player who is who is bringing 
you know, no, I'm not. I changed my mind. I was going to say I'm going to go with Corda because he brings more firepower. But the problem is yeah. that firepower only comes off the ground, and he's still yeah. not getting it from the serve. That was a big kind of a red flag for me. The serve just didn't help him against Mute. Yeah. And PCB is so – he's so tough to beat like that. And I, I do think that there's going to be – I think the tougher player from the baseline is going to win – and I see a high unforced error count again from Corda, just trying to make things happen against Carreño Busta. Sometimes we see strange matches from PCB where, where he's more aggressive and making a lot of errors. But I think when Carreño Busta is patient and he is uh, he's consistent, I do think that he can draw the er errors out of Corda, who just looks looks a little bit like a player who's caught in between. He's not someone who has extremely high shot tolerance, but he's also not someone who has the the weaponry off the serve to really be in position to finish points quickly, especially in windy conditions on an outdoor court like we saw against Boutet. And that's why he made I think I think over 90 unforced errors in that wow. win over Mute. Wow, it's a lot. Um and then just quickly on the women's side then so obviously radicani has gone Fernandez, Coco Goff, so all their youngsters, young superstars all out. Except um, Towson. Yep, except Towson, I was going to say, yeah, so she's kind of waving the flag for uh, the young stars going through. But oh, Sabalenka, I mean, she's still in, although she's made a lot of double faults on Force Sarah. She's lost the first set of both matches, then gone on to win. Magruth is obviously out, we said. But Barty and Osaka are looking to, they need to win one, one more match, and then they're in the fourth round playing against each other. Uh, which will be basically a final, really, um, <laughs> in a lot of people's eyes. But uh, how do you think the women's uh, side is shaping up? I I think I think the two favorites are probably uh, about to play, yeah. which is crazy. But that's that's a, a matter of uh, a function of Osaka not playing last yeah. year for the most yeah. part, and then she you know, falls out of the top four and then you get these kinds of things happening. But Osaka has looked really good. I think mentally she's in a good place. If we're, if we're playing armchair psychologist, it seems like she's enjoying the game again and competing really hard, I think. And she had that lapse of focus against Brengel. And then you could see her just flip the switch right back and be like, okay, four all now let's lock in again. Uh, no, no moping, no sulking, no panicking. Just let's lock in again. And then she wins the next two games in dominant fashion and gets that six love, six four victory in the last match. Uh, Barty, Barty's the best. I mean that that's kind of my take. Uh, I, I'm I always feel that way. I I think that she doesn't get enough respect even as world number one, being the the force that she is and. Against top 20 players, she's won something like 14 out of her last 15 matches, something in that ballpark against top 20 players. So um, I do think that Barty matching up with Osaka is the more complete player, um, defends a lot better, serves, and you know has that serve plus one game, uh, especially on the forehand, just like Osaka does. But I do think Barty just is more complete. She has that defensive capability. She has that variety. She has the net play, which we saw Osaka try out in the last yeah, match she did. to, she to, did, to yeah. mixed effect. Um, so, you know, Barty's definitely my, my pick to win. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what else I think. What are the other things well, to, to watch in your opinion with the draw and how it's shaping up it's interesting i mean sabalenka you'd normally say yes but she just looks like it, yeah i don't any moment i don't, I don't she's think so gonna be gone uh switzerland is yes. playing azarenka tomorrow which is a yeah. really interesting matchup um i'm not sure how that's, that one's gonna go and to be fair barty's not got an easy match against georgie who if she turns True. up like you know she's a good player and uh, it's just you know, <laughs> it just depends on how she's feeling really on the day. But um, there's there's a few people knocking out Krajcikova's in the draw, but it's not really you know hard courts. But Dosa is playing Kostyuk tomorrow, right? Which is a right, right. Normal match. But Dosa's been playing really well, but she's carrying a little injury. So you're like, don't know. So Bedosa, Sakari, they're kind of floating about as well. To be fair, 
I, I think Krejcikova is the one who is probably the most under the radar with the, with a chance to do big things because I feel like she's played really well on hard courts. She didn't mm. have a good end of last year. Yeah. But I think she was probably out of gas. Yeah, I think that's true. the the most realistic expectation uh, or not expectation, the most realistic read on that because she's not really used to doing what she did over the summer and it was a ton of tennis and she's never yeah. done it before and I think emotionally and physically she was done. But other than that, if you look at what she what she did after the Roland Garros, you know, losing to yeah. to Barty at Wimbledon, no shame in that. Yeah. Uh losing to um the eventual champions at like the next couple tournaments that she played. Uh she also lost to Barty again, I believe in Cincinnati. And then at the U.S. Open, she had that that crazy illness that, you know, she went against Muguruza and just was completely flat. And I, I think something was wrong at the U.S. Open when she got blown out by, I think it was Sabalenka. Yeah. Um, so she hasn't really had a chance to obviously make a big, surprising run on a hard court. But I feel like she's there. I feel like she's completely playing the tennis mm. uh, t- to, to do it. And I think that she deserves that respect in that tier two after, I guess, Osaka and Barty. Um, I think she's with like an Azarenka or uh, maybe a Sviantek and Bedosa in that tier two. Yeah. No, no, I agree. I agree. Bedosa is really exciting to watch. She really is. I love watching her play, mm-hmm. actually. Her against Kostyuk is like a really tough, tough match. Kostyuk's a really exciting player as well. Um, I'll quickly ask you, actually, I think you said, so on the women's side, I think you've gone Barty to win. Um, yeah. And, and is it Medvedev on the men's? Yes. And and who's your dark horse either side? So it can just be someone who you think is going to make a big run. I think, I guess, on the men's, it'll be Alcaraz or Sinner, I guess. Yeah, then I'll go. I guess if that's a dark horse, yeah, um, I think I think it is, uh, especially for Alcaraz, maybe being the thirty-one seed, but he's just better yeah. than his ranking. And then on the women's, I'll just stick with the theme of the the young, the young the youngsters, and I'll I'll go with Towson, who who just again I couldn't I couldn't have been more impressed with how she played against Contivate. Yeah, could you imagine if she wins the Australian Open? You've had Raducanu, then Towson, and then you know, just <laughs> crazy. Next thing you know, who golf wins the French Open? Um, <laughs> it'll be amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, is there anything you want to touch upon before we wrap up? Um, what do you think of the CUs of the what? Sorry, oh, it's CUs. horrific, horrific, <laughs> horrific. I mean, I play a lot of football, and I'm just uh, and I watch a lot as well. To be fair, but. Yeah, it's just, it literally just sounds like booing. And all the players, all the players, every match I've watched after, they're just like, it's so annoying. I think Murray in a press conference is like, it's so annoying. <laughs> and in his tone, and I, just, I was cracking up so much. But <laughs> Kyrgios, like you were saying, when he was serving, he was just saying to the crowd, like, stop. And then I think at the end, he did the celebration, the Ronaldo celebration, which is what, what it's for. But I think he just did it to appease the crowd. But I think no one, Medvedev was saying he hated it because they're doing it in between serves. Yeah, and he was like, "It's just stupid." And he said, "And actually, he thought they were booing Jim Courier." So he said, "He said to the crowd, he said, don't boo him. At least he's won two Australian Opens.'" <laughs> and I was like, "He's classy." And then he wrote Sue on the camera after winning. He's just, um, he just doesn't care, does he? Might love it, but yeah, it's so bad. It's like, uh, oh, you wouldn't know, I guess. But in cricket, there's a player called Root, and so they, the crowd cheer Root. Root, Root. It yeah. sounds like booze, right? Yeah. Um, and it's just. They completely missed the mark. I don't know why they don't just stick to the Aussie, 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 oi, oi, just stick to that. <laughs> like, why go to this? I don't know where it's come from either. No, that that's the question. I mean, what what is going on here? I mean, Ronaldo is, uh, I mean, what? He's, there's no, there's no Corey. big, <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's really no connection there. And uh, man, who knows? However, I, I will say that I think the best comparison is in, in the UFC, fans started wooing. Uh, like Ric Flair. Do you know Ric Flair? Yes, yeah, the WWE player. Yeah. Well, not playing wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so so that happened in UFC, and it was a train wreck. They could, they could not get, and I don't know if they've gotten it to stop yet, they couldn't get the fans to stop wooing uh, like Ric Flair because once someone does it, and then when people start to say it's annoying, it's annoying, it's annoying. They want to do it more. Uh, they want to do it more. So yeah. we'll see. 
Okay. It's just, oh, it's terrible. You just can't control them, right? I think almost you just need to ignore it. And then maybe, but it's just, I, I can just imagine the Australian Open final and you've got Mevin Evans, Verev, and they're like, the crowd going off. And you're like, are they booing both these players? And it's like, no, they're just, they're just, it's just crazy. They're just crazy. Suing. Yeah. Oh, ridiculous. Uh, well, anyway, thanks, Gil, for being on. Appreciate it as always. Um, hopefully we can catch up after the Australian Open, but good luck with the, the coverage on the channel as well and also your tennis channel uh, bits and bobs as well and it's going well so looking forward to it thanks Faisan same to you be well enjoy enjoy the rest and uh, we'll catch up soon thank you